growing as a person. Um, I mean, like I said, I used to be nervous talking in front of people. I stutter and say, um, a thousand times. I've probably said that a couple times already, but cut back on that. It's just a good opportunity to really, you know, grow as a person, make as much money as you can, kind of have the freedom that you want and not be confined to just sitting behind a desk, punching numbers all day, answering the people higher up that really, I mean, that you're replacing an answer. But a good salesperson is hard to replace. So, with that being said, if you're interested, um, the first class you take is just personal, or, uh, personal selling, intro level class. Um, it's honestly not that hard. You learn the basic steps, and then as you, if you want to continue to get a minor or a major, you take the advanced class, which is a little more in depth, uh, a little more pressure for presentations. But the personal selling class is offered on Tuesday and Thursday, 9 30 to 10 45 next semester. Along with, along with that 12 30 to 1 45. And then if you do work here in the morning, early afternoon, you have to take some night classes. It is offered 4 15 to 5. So if you are interested in that, I would definitely look into it. Uh, Bob Kaiser is the main teacher for the advanced class. Aguirre teaches some of the personal summit classes as well. So if you like another teacher, you could always get in his class. Uh, I would really recommend it. It's something that you know, I did. I was a basic marketing degree. I didn't know what I wanted to do besides make money. And I feel like it's the best opportunity for me to make money. Best opportunity for you guys to make a lot of money. So if that's something that you were interested in, I would look into uh, look into the classes. And if you have any questions, you can ask me or any of the professors, uh, Dr. Bob Kaiser or you know, Dr. And any more than But thank you for your time, and I appreciate it. Unifying theory. 
And so it's this critical aspect of marketing, and yet there is no a priori best way of going about determining what the price should be. It's largely dependent upon the goals of the organization itself. Now, price goes by a lot of different names. So, for example, you should know things like the price that you pay for your education is called tuition. Lawyers charge what? Fees, right? Um, so there are all these different names. A big part of price may be involved in terms of bartering now. And we talked about this when we talked about globalization and international trade, the idea that we might engage in bartering. Bartering accounts for billions of dollars in trade. The Kenyan shilling, for example, doesn't have a lot of value outside the country of Kenya. And so if they don't have enough hard currency, i.e. dollars, euros, Japanese yen, um, they may barter for other goods or services. And again, it accounts for billions of dollars in domestic trade, but it represents the sacrifice that each individual or firm is willing to give up in order to have something for the, uh, for the benefit of the servicer or the product that, that they're buying. The price equation for the third exam, I will allow you to use a calculator because there will be several questions that may ask you to calculate, for example, the final price, what the price equation is, or how you achieve uh, the price for certain things, um, what, what uh, markups and things like that are, and so you'll want to have a calculator for the third exam. And the price equation is the list price, and you should know this, and you may be asked to calculate it again, minus any incentive incentives I just spoke there. I had, when I became vice mayor in Denver years ago, we had a mayor who kept calling it incentives. It's incentives. Um, incentives or allowances plus extra fees. So think about this. The clearest example that a lot of people uh, know about is obviously a car. So there's the sticker price on the car, right? And it's going to be minus what? Things like what? What are some of the incentives that you will get when you go and you buy a new car? Rebates. Rebates for? Okay, cash allowance. Uh, things like customer loyalty, Ford, GM, Dodge, all that loyalty program. So usually if you're a second or third time buyer of a Ford, Dodge, or GM product or, a, or another car line, they'll usually give you something like $2,000 for customer loyalty and incentive. What else might they give you? Free oil changes. Free oil changes, okay. They might give you an incentive for end of year closeout when the car companies try a discount so that they can do what? Move inventory so that they can move the new inventory onto the lines and things like that. And then any um, added fees. So what are some of the fees that you'll see on uh, the price of a car? Tax. Okay, that's the taxes that you'll pay. Usually, though, what you're talking about in terms of cars are things like, how many of you noticed on your last car purchase that it said dealer prep? What is dealer prep? Or transportation. Dealer prep is all that stupid stuff that they put on that you don't want, that they're going to charge you for, like the stickers that say John Vance Country Ford on them. All of that stuff that they put on are, are the dealer prep. So that's how you arrive at the final price. The list price minus incentives plus the extra fees like the dealer prep that you pay for in the car. Price is an indicator in many instances of value. And in a minute, we'll talk about the demand curve, the way the demand curve normally slopes, but price is an indicator of value. Lots of people say that, that the higher the price, the what? The better the, the better the quality. Isn't it? Is that true? It can be used as a heuristic in terms of value. So it can be an indicator of value. 84% of people said a higher price indicates a higher quality. That's not necessarily always true. How many of you are wearing Nike shoes? I see one on the front row. Anybody else? There's another Nike there. Three sets of Nikes. 
are the Nike shoes. Does Nike actually manufacture shoes? They don't. They're a marketing company. Right? They, they buy shoes from other manufacturers, mostly in Taiwan or other uh, developing countries, and they resell them with the Nike brand on them. Do those factories oftentimes produce other shoes? They do. Is Nike any better quality? You're going to raise your hand. Um, I once had a teacher that got a discount on a car because it had the company's name on it. Because it had the company's There are companies that are doing that now, by the way, that will pay you. Uh, how many of you have seen these auto wraps that they do for advertisement? There are some companies that will now pay you. They'll give you gas. They'll buy your gas if you'll buy it. Uh, they'll get auto wraps. Those on your car. Yeah. Monster or Red Bull will give you money. You have a paid off card. You let them wrap your car in their logo. They'll um, pay you. And you put the Monster um, monster can on it. Uh, I've seen several of those. So yeah, there, there are companies that are doing that. Lots of companies are doing that for their employees now. If you will allow them to wrap your car, um, they'll pay for your gas. Even, even if it's just that little Gutenberg and Chevrolet thing on the back of the car. Yeah. Um, most dealers in the past have historically charged you, like I said, that's called dealer prep. Um, back to value. So value, uh, as Nike, Nikes are made in factories that back, manufacture all kinds of other uh, shoes. Is Nike any better quality than those? I don't know. There are some features that Nike has that no other brands have. So for example, what, uh, what are some of the things, what was Nike one of the first ones to introduce? The what? Okay. They were also the first to introduce what? Air cushion, the soles, right? So maybe, maybe that is. So decoding the price can be somewhat tricky. And consumers oftentimes use shortcuts, and this is one of the things that's a potential test question in terms of decoding the price for you um, in terms of discounts. So if a store says that everything is marked down 25% plus you take an additional 25% off at the register, does that mean that the item is half off? No, but lots of consumers think that it is. How much actually is it off? So for example, let's say the list price is $100 for a computer monitor. And they say everything's marked down 25% plus take an additional 25% of the register. What does that actually mean? Well, it means that the initial markdown makes the product 75%, and you get 25% taken at the register of that 75%, which is 18.75, which means that the price actually comes out to be 56.25, not 50%. So it's 56% uh, it's, uh, of the original price. So you're only getting uh, 44.75% off, not 50% off. But a lot of consumers don't go through the math, and so that may be one of the, the questions we'll ask you to calculate the actual uh, final price based on markdowns. Price affects both revenues plus costs. And you should know for the exam the profit equation. So profit is total revenues minus total cost. And this is another potential test question to ask you to calculate. So it's unit price, it's calculated as unit price times quantity sold minus the fixed cost plus the variable costs of production. Pricing objection, objectives are based oftentimes on the financial position that the company is in. And oftentimes, American firms, by the way, because they have to file things, particularly if they're publicly traded with the Securities and Exchange Commission, are oftentimes accused of engaging in short-term pricing objectives rather than long-term pricing objectives as their goals. And this happened at the company that I work for, the American Education Corporation, because we were required to file with the SEC every quarter a 10Q, and then at the end of the year a 10K. Our investors could see that. And so we would oftentimes engage in discounts at the end of a quarter to try and increase sales to increase revenues for those numbers that we would uh, report. And so profit. Um, you might manage for long-term profits. 
and a company may give up an immediate profit in order to penetrate the com uh, competitive market, for example, over the long term. Or they may use return on investment. This is usually, again, short term, quarter over quarter, and it's the one that a lot of American firms are oftentimes criticized uh, for engaging in. You might go for sales. One objective might be to increase sales, revenue of a product, or market share. And when we talk about integrated marketing communication, again, you'll have to tie all of this stuff in. Why is it that McDonald's continues to advertise? Is there anybody who doesn't know what McDonald's is? Coca-Cola, why do they continue to advertise? Is there anybody who doesn't know what Coca-Cola is on this planet at this point in time? Why do they continue to advertise? Because where do they have to go in terms of their market share, really? It's to stay relevant, because they risk losing market share when you are the market leader. Volume focusing on the quantity sold, and this can oftentimes be counterproductive, or sometimes your pricing objectives are merely based on survival. And so, for example, toy stores in uh, the contemporary era are oftentimes pricing on a survival mode. This happened to FAO Schwartz, and that's talked about if you have this version, if you're using this version of the text, and also Toys R Us faced some problems. Because where are people turning now to buy that stuff? Online. Looking for discounts and cheapers in places like Amazon. Also, some companies price based on social responsibility. So what's an example of a company that does this and engages in the price based on social responsibility? How about Tom's? What is Tom's motto? And they're engaged in social entrepreneurship. What's Tom's slogan? Buy one, get yeah, one for one. So for every pair of shoes sold, they do what? They donate a pair of shoes to people in need for social responsibility. <coughs> Pricing constraints, demand, cost of producing and marketing. In the long run, you have to cover costs in order to stay in business. The newness of the products can be a pricing constraint, depending on if you're trying to penetrate or establish a market. The stages in the life cycle, and this is talked about, if you have the older version of the text on page 325. Um, a single product versus a product line. A lot of times you will see things priced in such a way because they are based on the company's overall product mix. So for example, Companies that develop men's clothing may discount or sell certain articles of clothing in order to increase sales of others. What goes with a suit? What? A tie. Right? So pricing along the product line. And again, the company that I work for, we did this. The accountants, and it's one of the reasons that financials a lot of times are looked at differently. We use financial accounting information in order to make decisions, but oftentimes accountants look at that information differently than marketers. And so the company that I worked for, we had a product called Learning Letter Sounds. And it was a product that we never made any money on. In fact, it was a loss leader for us. And the accounting department constantly tried to get us, and our chief financial officer constantly tried to get us to harvest and divest ourselves of that product line. And those of us in sales and marketing would say, we're not going to do that. And we're going to continue to spend money. And they would look at the advertising budget that we spent on it, and they'd say, you're losing a lot of money. Well, Learning Letter Sounds was a product that would allow us to get our foot into a school system. And then, because they liked the product so much, they would oftentimes buy the rest of the suite of products that we had in terms of our advanced learning system management. And so it was one of those products that we based our product, and it was a loss leader. The accountants constantly wanted us to get rid of it, we kept, because it was based on our product line. Um, types of competitive markets are important. If you have pure competition, price is oftentimes dependent upon competitors. If you think about this, you can get on your phone and you can download apps for finding the cheapest gas. And when gas was approaching $4 a gallon, lots of people were doing this. How many of you actually get on apps and try to find the cheapest gas now? What's the gas prices today? It's what? Yeah, it's 185 over at the 7-Eleven on the corner 
of uh, Brian and Danforth. And so it's dropped a lot, and so that's not necessarily a big deal. But there's lots of competition for gas, right? There's lots of different gas stations, and so purely competitive market. In Stillwater, at one point in time, when my brother was going to school there, there were two guys that owned all of the gas stations in Stillwater. And gas prices in Stillwater, because it wasn't a purely competitive market, were always significantly higher there than they were uh, in other places in the, across the state, in particular like the, the Oklahoma City market, where you have lots of competition. Um, you can have monopolistic competition where you have uh, many sellers that compete on non-price factors. They may be engaged in avoiding pricing wars. An oligopoly in which you have a few sellers that really avoid competition because they lead to pricing wars. You see this kind of pricing engaged and by the airlines, right? There are not that many airlines out there. It's an oligopoly. They all know what they charge, and they all know what, which roads make the most money. And, and so at one point in time, for example, Southwest decided to discount their lines on certain routes that were very attractive to Americans' customers, and it engaged in a price war, and they actually stopped doing it after a while because it was not beneficial to either side. So in an oligopoly, you might have a few sellers that avoid price wars because it's not good for anybody. And then you can have a pure monopoly where pricing uh, is dependent on uh, you know, the fact that you're the only one, and that gives you an advantage. Generally speaking, we don't allow for monopolies, and under the Sherman Antitrust Act, we, we discourage them, but there are instances in which we do allow for monopolistic pricing. Things like what? So for example, if you contracted hepatitis C until about a year ago, that was a lifelong condition that was probably going to kill you. What has happened in the last year? They brought a drug to market which actually doesn't just treat hepatitis C, which is chronic hepatitis. It affects your liver. It actually cures it. What's the price? It's a patented drug. What's the price of that treatment? It's $170,000 is what they're Right? So that we allow monopolies in that, in that short instance or in that small instance. Regulatory agencies that govern monopolies in areas. So for example, if you are an Edmund resident, can you buy your electric from anything other than Edmund Electric? No, and they're actually a reseller. They have a monopoly in this area. You have to buy electric from them. If you are on city water, if you live in a city, can you buy your water? Can you drill a water well and have your own water? No. It's generally prohibited. You have to buy water from the city, so those are monopolies. Um, fundamentals of demand will play a role. Consumers' tastes change rapidly, and so the demand for products can, can fall, particularly in fad items. The price and availability of substitutes is something that will affect demand. And consumer income. So, Economists love this idea of supply and demand curve, right? So you have quantity on this axis, one, two, three, four, five, we'll say that's in thousands, say it's fifty, a dollar, dollar fifty for a product, fifty dollars, two fifty. Generally speaking, is demand a positive curve or an inverse curve? An inverse curve. There will be more quantity demanded at lower prices generally. Now there is one example that your text talks about that's a good example of where you don't have an inverse curve because price may be seen as an evidence of value, an increase in price may actually lead to an increase in demand. And this happened according to your text with a watch company called Tag Cure. How many of you know what a Tag Cure is? It's a Swiss made watch. They sponsor some of the competitions in tennis and things like that. They compete largely against Rolex. The average price of a tag uh, up until about uh, five years ago was about $250. They increased their price from $250 to their minimum price being $1,000, and it actually increased demand. Why? It was more like a Rolex then at that price point, right? And that was an indicator of quality. But generally speaking, theoretically, uh, demand is an inverse shape curve. One of my first 
offices was across the hall from an economist named Dr. Gene Caldwell. And I used to get tired of hearing this. Uh, supply is generally a positive uh, curve. You're going to produce more at the higher quantities at, at higher prices, right? And economists are fascinated by where, where supply and demand meet, which is called the, the what? The equilibrium price. And they're, they're just fascinated by this concept. If you price above the equilibrium price, so you've got to distinguish between movement along the curve and a shift in the curve. So demand is, and I got tired of hearing her say this over and over and over again, but you should know it. Demand is the entire curve, right? Supply is the entire curve. So you have to distinguish between movement along the curve and a movement in the curve itself. Economists, again, are, are fascinated with the equilibrium price. If you price above the equilibrium price, you have a surplus. If you price below it, you'll have a what? A shortage, right? So movement along the curve, if you decide to price your product lower, it may, you'll sell more units versus where if you increase demand for things like consumer income going up, which hasn't actually happened in the last several years in the American economy, but it could. We can see and there's going to be a debate tonight. The Republican candidates are going to debate. And the economy is a major focus of that debate. You're going to hear their economic policies. And all of the candidates are saying the same thing, that basically income or even the Democrats and the Republicans agree on this, it's where they think that you can affect it that changes, or how you can affect it. They all agree that for middle America, income has stayed flat, or has not even kept up with inflation. Right? So they're going to talk about their plans and policies tonight, you should watch the debate, in order to increase consumer income. So if we had an increase in, uh, in consumer income, for some reason, that would cause an actual shift in the demand curve, maybe, to the right or the left. The right, right? Now you've got a new curve. And greater quantity will be demanded at every single price along the curve. So be, be aware and be able to identify the differences between moving along and a shift in the actual curve. Estimating revenues, your text talks about estimating revenues. Total revenues is the price times the quantity. Now because revenues may vary because of discounts and things like that, average revenue is something that a lot of businesses focus on, which is total revenue divided by the quantity. And you should know the definition of marginal revenue, which is the change that results from producing one additional unit of product. One of the things that affects price is the elasticity. One of the products in your text says that, and it gives an example of a product that is inelastic, and that's gas. Is gas actually inelastic? To some extent, maybe. But what do you see a whole lot more of with gas at $1.85 a gallon? You see a lot more SUVs. You also see a lot more people doing what? Traveling, doing road trips, things like that. When gas prices go up to $4. And they've actually done this, so I kind of disagree with your text. They've actually done a study that shows that for every 50 cent increase in the price of gas, the number of deaths by automobile decreases by thousands, by percentages. Why is that? Because people are not driving as much, and when they do drive, what do they do? They don't speed when the, when the gas price reaches $4 a gallon. They accelerate smoothly. They don't slam on uh, the accelerator and, and got it. Um, what else don't you see happening? I love to go to the lake. I have a big boat. Well, actually, I'm, my boat's on the river now. But I have a large boat. When gas approaches four or five dollars a gallon, which means it's more like six dollars on the lake or on the river, what do people do with their boats? 
There's a whole lot more sitting and a whole lot less. I have a wave runner and I've got nephews who can run the gas tank out on a wave runner two or three times a day. He's got a 25 gallon gas tank. You know, when gas is approaching five dollars a gallon, I would be like, I'm buying one gas, I'm buying one tank for the weekend. That's it, folks. Right? When it's gone, it's gone. Um, so elasticity. Uh, and elastic means that an increase in price results in a large decrease in demand. So it's calculated by the percentage change in quantity demanded by the percentage change in price. And in inelastic, a 1% increase in price re results in less than a 1% 1 decrease, 1 decrease in demand. And you have unitary elasticity if you have a 1 for 1. It's exactly a ratio of 1 to 1. You should know how to determine cost, volume, and profit. Marginal analysis and profit maximization. As long as revenues from your sales for an additional product are greater than the added cost of production, then firms will expand, in theory. You should know what the break-even point is, which is fixed cost divided by unit cost minus variable costs. So arriving at the final price, demand-oriented pricing models that you can use include skimming. Now this comes from an analogy to the dairy industry where what do you do when you get the, the milk from the cow? It's got various parts, right? And what's the, the top part of it? Cream. The what? Cream. The cream, the heavy cream. How many of you have gone and bought heavy cream? How many of you actually, I like to cook, so I actually go buy heavy cream rather than buying Cool Whip. You can whip it up, make it into uh, whipped cream with sugar, it's really, really good, right? Then you have homogenized milk that becomes in various uh, levels of homogenization in terms of milk fat, right? And actually, is there that much difference in terms of calories and fat between 2% and whole milk? really not. Okay. But you can use the skimming, which is the idea of skimming the cream off the top, and it's usually used by innovators. So for example, when Apple <coughs> released the first iPhone, and I had friends, and I told you this, that went out and they were the first in line to get the iPhone, and they put their names on the list, and I said, wait six months, and it will drop. And it did. It actually dropped in three months. And I said, was it worth it to pay the price for that three months? And they insisted that it was. So innovators oftentimes will use the skimming where you release a product that's new, it's hot, like the Apple iPhone, and you're going to try and take advantage of that and get as much money as you can. The opposite of skimming, which is a demand-oriented pricing tactic, is penetration. What do you do when you penetrate? When you try and penetrate the market. You price it lower to get people to do what? To buy it, to try it. What kinds of products would you use maybe a penetration strategy to get people to try the product? Okay. Samples, like cereals, a lot of times will price products lower in order to try and attract. How many cereal companies come and go? or products that cereal lines come and go. They've got a frozen cereal. How long are the frozen cereals going to last? It's based on the movie, like, frozen. How long is that going to stay on the shelf? I don't know, right? As long as, frozen, as long as the frozen cartoon with Disney is popular, and it'll go out, and they'll try something else. So a lot of lower end items you'll try and break into the, into the market using the Prestige pricing, the example is that's accurate. Like they raised prices and sold more because it was then perceived as being more like Rolex than uh, lesser priced products. Price lining 
is where you assume that demand is inelastic between the price points, but elastic at those points. So you might sell, for example, slacks at three different price points in a store, assuming that it's relatively inelastic between those pricing uh, points. Odd even pricing, this is effective, but it can be overused and it leads to that. So what is odd even pricing? Where you price something, for example, at $39.99, which in the mind of the consumer is what? What are you relying on? That their, their heuristic says it's less than 40. It's not 40 bucks. Right? It's not two, uh, it's not two twenties. Bundle pricing is popular with a lot of services. So, for example, Cox bundles what? What is the bundle with Cox? Internet, TV, and what? Phone. How many people buy? How many people have a phone line just because it's cheaper if you get the Cox bundle than if you unbundle the phone line and don't use it? How many of you actually use a home phone? Anybody still have one? Why do you still have a landline? Because Cox wife. makes you bundle it. <laughs> no, my wife won't get rid of it. No. She won't get rid of the landline. Yeah, it ain't worth the argument. So. A lot of people kept landlines, yeah. <laughs> they what? They won't let you use their motor. If you don't get the phone. Uh, a lot of people kept landlines for a long time, even after they stopped using them because of alarms. They would have home alarm systems. But now they've got alarm systems that you no longer have to have a landline. They'll, they can use the cellular system and, and alert the company. And so uh, that's even become a, a thing of the past. Yield management, this is where you use a very complex pricing model, usually generated by computers to determine when uh, the most or peak pricing is. And you see examples of this in, for example, og is trying to get people to switch to the uh, off-peak hours, right? So that you set your thermostats down, you get the peak, you take their, their pricing model, you set your thermostats higher during the day, and then you use more at night. And for some people, that works well because they are not home during the day, and so they don't need it, and they're using less energy during the day when the performance and when it costs the most to do a lot of hours. Uh, airlines do it for flights based on what are the most uh, popular routes to figure those out, the times for those routes. And so generally speaking, if you'll fly on alternate dates, if you're flexible, you can oftentimes get uh, cheaper prices if you will come back, for example, not on a Monday, and you won't travel on a Sunday, if, you'll, if you can arrange your flights because they use fuel management systems to calculate those. Cost-oriented uh, pricing models are also common in a lot of businesses. For example, the standard markup is generally used in supermarkets. Uh, and other stores, retail outlets. Walmart, how did Walmart get really, really popular? What did Sam Walton insist on that he, that he instituted this pricing model? Well, it was a standard market, but it was less than everybody else in the industry. He had for his uh, stores, which were not in the grocery business at the time, he marked things up at a standard 30% across the board. Even if he got a really good deal, he told his managers not to mark up above 30%. So it was that sort of everyday low pricing standard markup. Cost plus. You can also have this profit oriented where you set a target profit. I knew a guy who did this in Guthrie in my hometown. He had a donut shop. He decided he wanted to make 30000 This was in the 1980s. $30,000 was actually a lot of money back then. Uh, for those of you who were around and remember the 1980s, it was a bleak time in Oklahoma. We went through the oil bust of uh, the late 1970s and oil prices bottomed out by about 1986. And he decided he wanted to make $30,000 a year for his donut shop. And so he just made enough donuts. He figured out how many donuts he had to sell every day. It was the most interesting business model I've ever seen because he would open at the same time every day, which is a 5.30 and he would close when he sold the last donut. And some days that meant he was closed he was closed at 9. Because he decided he was going to you know, set a target profit and he was going to achieve that profit. And when he made his $30,000, that was it. Um, a target return on uh, sales or a target return on investment. 
You also have competition-oriented pricing models. Again, there's no theoretical basis for why it, it's a lot, largely dependent on the market and the type of goals of the organization. So you might have customary pricing. What's the price of uh, Coke and the Coke machines out here? You get the 20 ounce bottle. What is it? Is it a dollar fifty? Is it a dollar twenty-five? Why? Why is it that price? That's that's what the standard price is that we expect to pay for a cup, right? It's like a dollar, dollar fifty, dollar seventy-five, somewhere there. So customary pricing, at, uh, above or below uh, pricing based on competition, and then loss leader pricing, where you do what? What is loss leader? Where you produce or you price something below cost so that you can do what? You can attract customers and opening that they'll buy other things once in the store, right? Supermarkets do this. There are some pricing constraints that are imposed based on competition, and the idea is a fair competition and regulation. And so those are things that you should also look out for the exam. All right, are there any questions about the pricing? Everything is clear as day. Again, you may have calculations on this third exam, so you may bring a calculator for that. Um, would you pass your Folger balance app so that nobody sees them? This way, not this way, hold them this way. Like this. And pass them to this end of the classroom and I will pick them up. Where's the roll sheet?